Good morning, everybody. I'm Julia Sanagata, one of the Automation System Group Managers here at Rumsey. Appreciate you joining today to talk about remote access options for being able to get access to your plant, a machine, a line from a remote location. Leading today's discussion is Dave Kang, uh, one of Rumsey's industrial networking and security specialists. Dave has a multitude of experience um, coming to us many years ago from a traditional IT background and having spent the last few years focused uh, very specifically on networking relative to the plant floor, networking for the plant floor. So with that, Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Julia. As Julia said, uh, my name is Dave Kang, and I'm one of the networking specialists. Uh, in my past life, uh, I spent more than 13 years in the IT world uh, through data centers, networking, uh, disaster recovery, business continuity, virtual migrations, cloud migration, hybrid storage. Um, I like to say whatever the buzzword, I've dealt with it. Um, I made the transition in 2016 to OT networks and have since been specializing in the industrial networking space. Um, analyzing the consequences of Ethernet on the plant floor and how to protect the performance of manufacturing networks. So you are here to learn simple and easy remote access, and this is how I've designed our discussion. Um, the, the session, by the way, is one of the more popular ones thus far in our webinar series for the obvious reasons. Uh, we're obviously extremely uh, experiencing a, dy a uh, dynamically changing and uh, extremely challenging environment for our businesses. Uh, fortunately, we do have technologies such as remote access available that can make our businesses solder forward, even in the face of this. So what we want to cover is why have remote access, how does it work, what else can you do with it, and who builds these solutions. So why have remote access? Apart from the obvious current situation, why else do you want remote access? Um, traditionally speaking, uh, and I don't know if you can call five to six years a tradition, but I'm just going to say it anyway, uh, remote access devices are looked at as a convenience by a machine manufacturer. Uh, once deployed in the field, uh, an engineer can get to the PLC to do programming, uh, change parameters in other devices, or anything that would require local access to the machine, but from another remote location. I see a lot of you are from companies where these machines are installed, which is the only reason I really bring this up. This is traditionally an OEM or uh, systems integrator device, but given our circumstances, it might be one of the fastest and easiest ways to gain secure remote access. Uh, for this reason, a lot of the discussion here centers around an OEM, but think about how things might apply for your organization as a whole as well. I've heard countless times about stories of uh, machines not functioning as it should, so a, a repair call gets sent out, the OEM has to respond, book flights. During that time, you've got an inferior product or a non-functioning line, and it's essentially shut down, so production is halted. Uh, a few days later, OEM engineer shows up. Turns out that someone flipped a bit in the program, and what should have been a 30-minute job ended up taking several days and a massive expenditure for what the issue was. Um, I've also seen outfits using these products to be able to diagnose and troubleshoot situations where it's critical for an engineer to be on-premise at his shop mostly because he's the only one there. And uh, take a commissioning situation. You have someone taking care of the physical installation, handling the mechanics of it, but a programmer might be there just in case. And they're standing around idle, waiting for when they're needed, and uh, just overall not a great use of resources. Their time is most likely better spent elsewhere. Um, then there's other things like devices with integrated VNC servers. Um, if you can see what an operator sees on the HMI, it could make things a lot easier to diagnose just by looking. And a lot of these devices have the ability to relay those screens out securely to an engineer remotely. Also becoming more common uh, using an IP camera or webcam. Uh, I don't know if any of you shop for a webcam lately. Uh, you're not going to find one. Uh, to use uh, to show a video feed of unexpected behavior or uh, abnormalities. Um, this is just a piece, a small piece of the utility you can take advantage of with remote access solutions. Dave, if I can so, ask you a quick question there. When sure. you say um, VM, VMC with HMIs, do most of the panel view pluses have that capability? They do, yes. That's a default feature. It just needs to be turned on. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so what are some other possible remote applications, depending on who you are, right? For an OEM or machine builder, you might want to connect to correct a problem with a machine using uh, fix that inadvertently changed value or some other minor error. A systems integrator might be tasked with the maintenance of a specific line or set of machines and can really improve that response time uh, to respond to an alert state. And the end user might want it for the fact that someone on second or third shift might be running into a problem that they don't know, they don't have the skills to resolve. And instead of having to go into the plant, you might be able to rectify the problem without going in, supporting a uh, differing skill set. And of course, with things as they are, uh, maybe you just plain can't get in every single day when you need to. Uh, we're all adapting and working through a situation that arguably no one alive today has ever faced. Uh, so we can still make progress and answer these challenges. How does remote access technology work? So in the past, uh, here's the typical remote access situation. I see this one in water wastewater all the time. There's a machine with its associated network installed in a facility somewhere in the world. You, as the party looking for remote access, are somewhere else in the world or state or city or whatever. You are on a different network. You connect to the internet and attempt to access uh, the machine network. <clears throat> So there's going to be a firewall in place denying any unwanted traffic to the machine, including the people who legitimately need remote access. So problems here. In order to configure this correctly, you require some intervention from IT, who will inevitably object to either opening holes in the firewall or granting a third party access to any piece of their network. Uh, in most cases, they don't have any visibility into the plant floor in the first place, so it's often unusual to me. Uh, it also constitutes a change management situation, even if you can get the permission for it, along with the process for it. And in most cases, you won't see a result for quite some time. So uh, this solution is known as port forwarding, and um, it's fundamentally flawed from a security standpoint and exposes devices to the outside internet that literally anyone can access. And uh, finally, since the IT's visibility into the plant floor is usually limited, even though they might not even know uh, that a PLC is accessed, they know they just know they don't want anyone else not in their organization touching it right so generally speaking it's a non-starter so in most facilities you'll have a firewall with a vpn a virtual private network and a bit more on that later um, this is the typical method that's used and it's excellent and the textbook how it should be done type of solution uh, same machines same remote access user connects via a VPN client to the internet to create a secure encrypted tunnel. All authentication and authorization occurs on the firewall. This is a great solution because authentication and access is granted at the company level. However, the, the uh, change controls can be time consuming. They can be cumbersome and will require the full support and maintenance uh, by IT professionals on site. So that traffic is blocked. We're talking about block traffic and authentication and authorization. Uh, allows traffic here. Um, so the change controls uh, can be time consuming and cumbersome and will require support of the maintenance by IT professionals. Even if the external access is allowed, IT needs specific guidance and account creation, permission distribution, and the ability to monitor and audit. There's also typically a license or subscription based on the C count for VPN users that can constitute an additional expense. And not only that, for this to truly function correctly, the firewall should be sitting in the perimeter of your industrial demilitarized zone, have an application proxy server configured to accept and work with inbound connections, so there's no direct access to any automation device. While this is generally considered the way and the best solution, with uh, the scale and the complexity increasing, the simplicity and usability of the solution is dramatically decreased, not to mention expense. So what's the alternative here? Uh, we would say using a VPN router appliance. So what is a VPN router? Uh, pictured here are some examples of VPN routers. Uh, generally speaking, they're industrially hardened, in rail mounted, 24 volt DC uh, appliances designed to fit right into a local machine's control enclosure. They're completely ethernet driven, so they can be integrated into a larger system without, uh, with additional nodes without much issue. 
All of them have a WAN or wide area network connection and a LAN or local area network connection and allow data to move between them, hence it being a router. The WAN connection is an internet connection of some kind and these solutions rely on connectivity to the internet. So how is that achieved? There are several ways. Cellular, which is probably the easiest way to do it, is uh, based on 4G LTE support and uh, coverage and deployment can be extremely easy at this point. Provisioning for data really has never been easier as far as that goes. Uh, using a Wi-Fi connection, you can connect to an existing plant network Wi-Fi, or if that's not allowed, you could even use a guest Wi-Fi. Uh, it just needs uh, to have some kind of internet connection, not necessarily connected to anywhere else on the corporate network. And uh, Ethernet would be the most stable, but usually tougher to get clearance for. Um, ideally, your IT has issued you some usable IP addresses or uh, have given you a modified DHCP scope that allows you to uh, use that outbound connection. The uh, VPN itself, uh, what is a VPN? Well, a virtual private network uh, extends a private network across a public network, right? So it encrypts the traffic. Um, this type of router, it allows the WAN to interface with the LAN. And uh, th so think of the network you have at home. You have an external WAN IP address, just one of those, and any number of devices on your home network with a local IP address, okay? It's essentially the same concept here. The VPN enables users to send and receive data across that shared or public network as if they were directly connected to the private network. And I mentioned the transmissions are encrypted. The data is going to be sent, so it's not readable. Um, it won't be in plain text. If it was intercepted, it would look like gibberish and just a bunch of meaningless characters. Um, the other pieces you would need for the solution is the cloud service. Uh, it's an application running in the cloud, right? What is the cloud? It's really just a data center. Um, the, the cloud service is going to control the encryption and authentication. Uh, for example, ProSoft calls theirs ProSoft Connect. E1 calls theirs Talk to M. Phoenix Contact has one out there. They call it the MGuard Secure Cloud. Whatever the name, as at the core, they all pretty much serve the same purpose, providing that encryption, authentication, authorization, and auditing. Let's take a look back to the same example with uh, an industrial VPN router. You have the machine installed somewhere out there with a VPN router on board. You're at the remote location trying to access that machine network. So the VPN uh, router itself will send data outbound only through the firewall. So there's no need to open anything in the firewall except for outbound traffic. In most cases, most environments, uh, HTTPS 443 or UDP 1194, which are the typical ports used for uh, VPN access, are going to be open anyway. Then you would log into the VPN connecting to the cloud service. You see it's an outbound connection from you and from the VPN router. The cloud service handles the handshaking authentication and encryption. And since the origin of the data came from behind the firewall in the first place, the firewall can recognize the connection state and allow return traffic. Same goes for your laptop. Remote connectivity is achieved. So this alternative method is simple, secure, and again uses outbound only traffic to establish connectivity. No additional firewall ports typically need to be open. So this is an example of logging in through Ewan's eCatcher, uh, which is the name for their VPN client. ProSoft solution doesn't have a separate uh, client and it uses integrated Windows VPN con uh, connection tool. Um, so you'll be presented with this login screen. You enter your credentials, account name, username, and password. Uh, just a reminder, always use complex passwords and or a password management tool such as 1Pass, KeyPass, LastPass, or even better, a YubiKey. Um, identify which of the devices you would like to connect to. In this example, we have multiple E1 devices in this account. Um, I'm selecting this particular control logics processor and panel view. Uh, so I click connect. Just wait a moment there. I'm sorry. In that case, if you were a machine builder or a corporate engineer and you had multiple out there, you would literally just pull up the software, log in, and then you'd see all your remote connections, pick the remote connection and tell Correct. us to connect, that was it? 
Yep, and you can even na uh, rename these headings to the specific location, whether it be the location of the plant geographically or even where it is on the plant floor. Um, lots of different headings that allow you to uh, specifically identify it. Great, and I see at the top there it says opening VPN tunnel. Mm -hmm. So it just takes a moment. Once it establishes that connection, this is something you'll see. Now, because of the E1 that I selected here, um, the current um, availability, I would expect to be able to see this control logic processor and this panel view plus um, at the address 192.168.120.2. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm at 120 or 192.168.33.57 at the moment, so I'm completely off the network there. Um, Open up a command prompt to ensure that you can reach the processor, just issuing a standard ping command. And you can see that the replies are coming through, even though I'm not physically connected to that network. So then I look at RS links, for example. I can see the device. In this case, it's the EMBT module that is installed on the control logic chassis. So another example of the connection uh, directly ac accessing the ENBT module associated with the control logics, right? Um, this is the device manager screen. You can see all the statistics that are available by directly accessing to it. So um, a reminder that ProSoft version uh, doesn't use a VPN client, but the process is really similar. Uh, it doesn't require an additional piece of software, though. So it's handy if you're not given admin privileges, for example, for your work PC. So solutions like this have gained general acceptance by IT because they do not require firewall changes, right? Um, it's leveraging existing outbound only connections. Uh, some have hardwired key switches that control the nature of the connection. For example, the internet connection is going to be on or off or the VPN on or off uh, with a physical switch that actually gets selected. Um, they have the ability to segment and restrict the connections over the VPN to specific devices. If you don't want the entire subnet open to availability, there's an option for that. Uh, some actually even allow integration to existing Active Directory credentials via SSO or single sign-on. Uh, a few of them have the option of not using a separate piece of software, as I mentioned, such as the ProSoft one. Um, and certain types have a feature known as virtual lockout tag, tagout, for example, the ProSoft uh, example. Uh, this would require a time limit purpose uh, be submitted to an authorized party within the uh, organization. And without their authorization, someone can't get on. Okay. So uh, these are all security features that have been added that sort of get some more uh, buy-in with uh, IT departments out there. So that's really how simple uh, remote access can be achieved. Um, deployment varies really from vendor to vendor. It can use a variety of different connectivity options, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, cellular, uh, pretty much any wireless provider, and uh, all the options that are available there. Um, ideally, of course, the machines uh, will have these devices installed on them before they go out. That's the best case scenario, but the deployment of them for retrofit or even temporary purposes is not out of the ordinary. We see that all the time, actually, and it uh, really could be invaluable at a time such as this. Um, so if you're thinking about this and you're looking at it like, oh, this is kind of an atypical situation, um, all of you on the call, you're here for a reason, right? So what's being asked of us, whether we're OEMs, integrators, or end users, is, is kind of a lot, right? Uh, we're all dealing with it by whatever means possible. Um, using devices like these, it's not unheard of um, to as a means to an end, and it's absolutely normal for retrofit installations. Just think about that as, uh, you know, if you're kind of thinking about, well, I, I have a critical piece of machinery that I absolutely need access to all the time. It's a great solution just for that. So what else can you do with uh, remote access to devices? Well, most solutions um, will offer these uh, additional capabilities. Uh, network address translation. This will allow access to both the local area network resources and wide area network resources um, by uh, being able to use uh, devices that are installed on either side of the uh, interfaces, right? Uh, WAN failover. 
for example, if you have multiple methods of connectivity, a hardwire and a cellular connection, for example, uh, the WAN connection can fall back to the other connection to maximize that availability for you to access. And um, some of the devices with uh, the digital in that has that key switch, you can actually use that to change the status of that digital in to uh, cause an SMS or email to be sent out for notifications. And uh, on the topic of notifications, uh, what if you could do more? So with a more advanced piece of hardware, such as Ewan's Flexi 205, uh, the remote access capabilities can really go above and beyond what you've come to expect from a typical remote access device. For example, the notification features I mentioned, you can actually configure alarms and notifications on four threshold levels or for values that you know are out of tolerance for a system, or just if you need to know if it hits a certain level. A uh, good example, if uh, pressure is building up in a tank and at levels that might be undesirable, you could have a different level of alarm and notification for this uh, if the situation ever occurs. So it will trigger an SMS or email alert that tells you who uh, tells whomever you need to know this information right away, uh, whether it be multiple users, uh, multiple different times, multiple methods. Uh, Ewan provides the mail relay and SMS relays, so you won't need to do any specific connection or gain access to a, a local resource. Um, so you can sort of bypass that as well. And of course, uh, obviously the data uh, that you're monitoring in order to issue those alarms, uh, that's being recorded, right? Uh, how else would it be able to do that? So data monitoring is an aspect of these devices uh, that can be configured uh, via the onboard web interface. Um, you can log up to a a million points on 2,500 different tags at around one second intervals. Um, you can actually even expand that capacity via uh, SD card. And it doesn't matter what type of PLC you have, it can understand protocols from multiple different vendors. The Flexi contains an onboard web server that can display a real-time view, a summary of, of, of alerts, data trending, and is displayable onto a smartphone or tablet. So this is ideal for anyone trying to get a display of the status of the machine who might not necessarily understand what a PLC tag value even is. So it's great as sort of a read-only visual tool. So this information will stay on premise and it's not shared to any outside parties. It's just a local connection. Uh, it's simply a visual web access of the values that are stored on the device. Of course, if you don't want to spend the time customizing a pretty screen like the uh, last screenshot there, there's a built-in KPI dashboard that's simply going to display tag values and names uh, as long, along with their value or with their values there. And they're more designed for the use of an engineer than say an operator or management, somebody who uh, wouldn't really understand what the tag value means. And again, that uh, data stays on the prem on premises unless you don't really want it to. So built important. I think a lot of people often have questions about that. Um, if they do do some data logging, they don't necessarily want their data in the cloud um, and that it's important that it stays on the device there. Right. And by default, it will stay on the device, but you do have the option of uh, shipping that data out, right? So built into the cloud service from E1, the 205, uh, it ships about 10 days worth of data up to what they call the data mailbox. Now, why this becomes important is because they've also issued um, an application programming interface or API uh, that's available to hook into that data. So if you want to use that for programming uh, via a partnership or if you want to do it yourselves, um, there's a ton of third party vendors out there that can assist you uh, to build a custom solution. So how's all this data used? Well. At the core, the Flexi itself is an integrated OPC UA server, so it's essentially how the tag values from the PLC are read in the first place. So what this is going to do is allow super streamlined connectivity to a SCADA or a historian, for example, um, or you can commit the resources to create custom reports. Uh, it understands Java or basic scripting. Or um, with uh, SciTech XL Reporter, it's a product that we've been using for these types of applications for reporting. Uh, for quite some time, uh, out of the box, it's going to do some uh, reporting through templates. Uh, so for example, you have a six site manufacturing company, uh, corporate offices in Boston, and they're tasked with pulling data out of multiple sites, disseminating that data into reports that are readable by management, 
for their production numbers and efficiency, right? Excel Reporter's new integration using the Flexi as a data source can fetch that data sitting on the Flexi, uh, send it to Boston, the corporate office, and store it there, report on it, and then distribute it. The capability leverages the um, data mailbox that I mentioned, and it's going to upload the data from all the sites to consolidate and pull the data, uh, report, and then send out the email. Dave, we do have a question in the chat uh, mm -hmm. uh, regarding the web server display. Actually, so I guess that's a little different than Excel Reporter. Would that would the web server display be visible through a browser on your phone, through an app outside of the local network? Yeah, absolutely. So in the case of uh, the the E1 Flexi, there's actually a uh, for Android or iOS, there's a separate eCatcher um, app that creates that VPN tunnel. Um, you can configure it that way, or you can actually uh, access it via HTML5 on just the web website that you would log into directly on the site as well. So you can go about it either way. So you wouldn't need to be on the network, on the local network, to see that? Correct, in, in either case. That's correct. The uh, software um, is going to allow you to automate the generation of reports and send them at whatever the desired interval is um, so preloaded template based um, the layouts are all designed to reduce time uh, reduce the time you have to spend designing them and uh, um, get closer and faster to uh, sending out usable data and so I, obvious if, sorry if I could just with the Excel reporter yeah. if you guys aren't familiar with that it's it's really neat Excel based templated um, software to help you pull some data into some pre-configured reports. It certainly does not replace a historian or a right, vantage right. point or custom reporting or plant metrics type of thing, um, but it's an easy way to get data started in some pretty standard formats. Right. The same would go for any of the data logging on the Flexi. It is by no means a replacement for a historian. So obviously, uh, you came to learn how easy remote access can be. I hope that kind of clarifies uh, what we can do and what our options are. And um, maybe you weren't aware of those additional features that are parts of uh, these types of devices. So there's a ton of different options out there, different features, capabilities. So who makes them? Well, you might be interested in only the remote access, or perhaps you heard a specific feature that you're interested in. Maybe you want to do everything that I went over. Uh, the fact is I covered multiple product lines, multiple vendors, multiple technologies in an effort to speak to you in more general terms. Of, you know, Obviously, some of that stuff is limited for uh, the Flexi, but uh, it's not the only option out there. Uh, there's a lot of products, um, but you might want to talk in more detail with me or a member of my team so we can talk about what your specific goals are and create a solution designed to achieve them. Ewan, uh, the makers of the Cozy 131 remote access appliance and the Flexi 205 VPN router are an uh, HMS company. They excel in protocol gateways and on-machine wireless and wireless cable replacement alternatives. Uh, ProSoft Technologies um, are the makers of cellular and Ethernet-based remote access and VPN appliances also known for their industrial protocol gateways and long-range fast-roaming industrial wire, uh, wireless hardware. And SciTech makes the Excel Reporter software. All of these companies are Rockwell Automation and Compass partners, uh, fully supported by Rumsey, uh, with whom you can start a discussion with um, any of our specialists, and we'll help you to find um, a solution that fits your needs. So thank you for tuning in today. Uh, if you have any questions on today's topic, please contact your Rumsey rep or any member of our ASG team. Also, don't forget the specialist team will be hosting these tech talks every Tuesday and Thursday through the end of May. Uh, the link above will take you to the full schedule, so please join us again soon. Thank you very much, guys.